So this is the packet of notes provided to me for this chapter. I want to read you three sentences from the intro for me for the chapter. This is perhaps the most important of the macro chapters. Second sentence, most students find this to be one of the most challenging chapters in the textbook. Shucks. Third sentence, this is one of the more challenging chapters to teach. Shucks. So it's hard I to teach never, Now here's my, I'm adding my own sentence. What? Yeah, this is, um, I have never taught this chapter before. Oh. Never made it this far. It's me rough. So here we go. We it's could the just stop here teach. so you never have to teach it again. We don't even have to learn it. We can just do that. But she says, well, you I'm need it for the test. We're both taking the exam. This not. is the difference between a three and a four or a four and a so five. So if I'm not taking it, can we just... Yeah, no. I'm going to check, check out. Yeah, have fun with that. Okay. All right. This will give you uh, an eight or nine point difference on the exam, too, on the final exam. All right. What are economic fluctuations and what are their characteristics? How does the model of aggregate demand and aggregate supply explain economic fluctuations? You're going to find we refer a lot to ASAD here, ASAD. So you're still going to be operating with a graph, but the aggregate supply, aggregate demand graph looks very different. The curves no longer look like our old friend curves. <laughs> Why does the aggregate demand curve slope downward and what shifts it? So we're going to get determinants, different determinants. What was that, Gavin? Oh, like you when my nose and like burn, you know when pop like goes like, oh no. So what is the slope the of the aggregate supply curve in the short run versus the slope of the aggregate supply curve in the long run? And what shifts the aggregate supply curves? Can we define aggregate Have you had no science classes at all? No. 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 Aggregate oh, is all of the supplies. Yeah, so, so here's the deal. So far, we have dealt with one person's demand or one person's one firm supply, right, of one good. Now we're talking about all the supplies and all the demands. We are truly into macro. <laughs> nice, nice. Exciting. All right. In the long run, real GDP grows about 3% on average. We have been lagging behind that growth rate since the downturn. In the short run, GDP fluctuates around its trend, just like um, the economic fluctuation graphs that we've looked at before. We're slower, we're faster, we're slower, we're faster. Our growth is, is less, it's more. In a recession, you see rising uh, unemployment, you see falling income, and growth is below that trend line of 3%. During a depression, it's worse. A depression is just a recession on steroids. Um, they are more extended, they are more severe. Depressions are rare. Recessions are relatively common. It was like 2008. The short run economic fluctuations that we get are called business cycles. Business cycles are irregular and they're unpredictable and anybody who tells you that they can predict them with any degree of real accuracy is blowing smoke in your general direction. It's just not a doable thing. So there's our real GDP growth over the past 50 years. Can you see 2007? Yeah. It was a pretty severe recession compared to the Reagan recession of 83, 84. 
There are other recessions in there. Do you think you can see them? There they are. When you look at some of these others, right? The nineteen seventy one looks pretty minor, right? Fact two. Macroeconomic quantities, the, the, the consumption, the investment, the savings, um, the government spending, the net exports, they all tend to move together. When one is depressed, the others are also depressed. Okay? So now your graph isn't showing you GDP, it's showing you investment spending, showing you the I portion of GDP, and the recession bars are still there. So do you see how they correlate? No. So I want you to look in particular here at this 2007 recession, okay? And remember your line is investment spending. Look at what its trend is here. We're going to go back and look at how GDP growth really continued to rise through that recession and dropped dramatically afterward. See that? You see why GDP growth dropped. Because you have to invest now to spend later, to grow later, to increase productivity later. And when investment dropped that significantly, it was almost impossible for investment to grow that much. Now, look at how rapidly investment grew. This is when the Federal Reserve Board bottomed out the interest rates. Well, investment spending was really cheap then. They incentivized it heavily, didn't they? All right. Unemployment. Remember, what are our trade-offs? Unemployment and what are the things we trade off? What, 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 what one thing do we trade off with unemployment? You, you, face, you face a short-term decision. You have a choice between low unemployment and low inflation. You can have one or the other. You can't have both at the same time. Okay, so still have our recession bars. Now your graph line is showing you the unemployment rate. Pretty ugly and pretty universal that it's bad during a recession. As output falls, unemployment rises. That should by this time be really common sense for you, correct? Because we've talked and talked about how the circular flow either is expanding or contracting. So when we get into an expansion period, you see unemployment fall. Look here at the uh, 83 recession. Look at how dramatically unemployment fell. It went back to pre-recession levels and then went even lower than it had been before. That's fantastic. Right? Where are we now? If we continued this curve down here, where would we be now? Yeah, we'd be clear right back down here around the lowest historical levels. Awesome. We should be seeing, if we assume things work this way, pretty good growth now. But we aren't. So we've got to figure that out. Okay. There are lots of theories about why these things work the way they do. And we are going to get into some political disagreements because the theories tend to be based upon political beliefs, uh, beliefs about how government should operate, etc. Okay. Um, most economists are going to use the ASAD model to study how this stuff moves and why it moves the way it moves. Okay. 
we are then leaving classical economics behind when we start looking at ASAD. So we use classical economics to explain long run, but in the short run we have to live in the ASAD model to make some sense of this stuff. So Keynes and Smith are, are not our friends when we're looking at this in the short run. So remember our classical dichotomy from a couple of chapters ago, maybe three chapters ago? Does anybody remember the classical dichotomy? Where are our two groups? Real and nominal. Very good, Scott. Real and nominal. Here's your other thing that you're going to lose. In the SAD model, money is no longer neutral. So it just amazing what we learned in the last chapters. No, because what you learned in the last chapters is valid when we're talking about long run. That was but we have to forget about that for this chapter. Yeah, for the well, short run. This is probably yeah, why it's yeah, so she hard. She told us before that it affected the long run, but the short run. By right, some short run, last chapter. Real, does that mean? What? Because does that mean if I suck the last chapters, then I can suck? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose you're probably hoping so now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, last chapter. All right. Even the classical economists understood that their theories weren't so good at the short run stuff. They knew that it's not quite fully explaining everything for us. They just dealt with their, they just rested in the, in the belief that it's only the long run that really matters anyway, so we've got that, got that handled, we've got it explained. But more modern economists have said, no, we, we need to know um, why things are happening in the short run and how we can impact them to try and stabilize things for the long run, to minimize these fluctuations. And so it's where you get all of this study of the short run. So when you're thinking about the short run, when we change the nominal variables, when we change that right now kind of stuff, it can really impact the real variables. If you change the price level, of course that has an impact on GDP. Right here, right now, this minute. Doesn't it? Anybody know what the going rate for a pound of beef is these days? Anybody who's done any shopping with folks? For ground beef? How about not ground beef? You were looking for a steak or a roast. A sirloin's running about eight a pound. Anything better than a sirloin, nine, ten, eleven dollars a pound. Um, I was at Fairway last week. Um, my eyes slid past the ribeyes, which were priced at eleven ninety nine a pound. That's a lot of money for somebody like me. We haven't had steak. We haven't had anything but the very cheapest cut of steak in over a year. It's a lot of money. So our consumption is down. We may be an anomaly. I don't know. Chicken's pretty cheap right now. We're eating a lot of chicken and pork. Okay. Thank you. Where do you think you're going, boy? Have a good return. Good luck with that. All right. They lost it. So in order to study, they lost. They lost my application. They put it in the wrong file. They said it comes in last Tuesday. They finally found it, and uh, like, that affect your chances? I mean, I'm gonna be like literally the last person, so hopefully that helps. It's good to see you dressed up for it. No, my dad's calling me out. Okay. It doesn't start till 1:30. You gonna get a haircut too? Uh, I got one last week. <laughs> it looks like it doesn't. All right. I had to, I had to work. He's got one. one he got one of them. That's a long time. Don't worry, I'll go home. He got one. Shave some more. 
All right, so here is our ASAB model or ADAS model. Okay, so you still have P on the y axis, but now to greater confuse you, the x axis is y. Why? We're not already screwed before. Just don't write the letter Y. Yeah, write GDP instead if you prefer. But keep in mind it's real GDP. No fake GDP going on in here. So there's your aggregate demand. If you are graphing aggregate demand, your label must be A, D. Your label must be capital A, capital D. This demand curve looks remarkably similar to the demand curves that we have played with before, because it is. But she's just playing with us. That's not actually. It. But I'm not playing. It's squiggly line. <laughs> it's actually when you zoom in. The supply curve. Oh, Jesus! I can't. Sure. Run. <laughs> aggregate supply looks a lot like your Spread. supply curves of the past. But pay but. attention to its label. Stress. S R A S. Wow. Short run aggregate supply. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Equilibrium is still in the middle. EQ oh. for E. Okay, we're still good there. From the short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand intersection, we get our price level and our GDP. Real GDP. Okay, what used to be price and quantity. Okay. So, aggregate demand. shows you the quantity of all goods and services. Whereas before we put a label on this and we called it shoes, or we called it PCs, or we called it wheat, right? We're not giving it a goods label because that's very micro. This is now all goods and all services. It's Gavin's haircut and a fairness pedicure and uh, Dayton's removal of his ingrown toenail, and Scott's I do that filling. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Wait, how, how can you put like, uh, all the prices and like, goods and services, and just don't they like, generate it's certain prices? It's all of them. It's the price level. It's the price level. Oh. Price level. Oh. 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 What? So oh, it, the principle behind why it slopes is the same as the principle behind why it slopes microeconomically. As the price level of all goods and services increases, the quantity of all goods and services which you demand Increase. decreases, thus decreasing GDP because you are consuming less. Okay, so we're all we're all okay so far. You said take the quiz, you're ready? No. Yeah. What's that number say? 11. There are 68. Oh. oh. So we'll be done by the one. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we got. Quiz on Monday. Kidding. We got plenty of time. We just have an 80% scale. I don't even have it written. What? I have no idea what this quiz We still have 30 minutes, guys. We literally heard scared laughing. It's me.
Did you watch the video about the one of Trump's like judge nominees for some lower district was asked if Brown was more was ruled correctly like it was a good decision and she didn't answer and she wouldn't answer the question. So she wouldn't answer if she, like God it was ruled. Bless America. It was so funny we were watching it. She's like, no, I can't rule because then that would if I don't rule like the way my boss did, which would be the Supreme Court, then that jeopardizes my job. And I'm going to do, I'm going to uphold whatever law was precedent, regardless of my faith, values, and beliefs. I'm like, oh, so regardless no. if you're racist so, or not? Uh, That's a pretty good stock answer. Someone yeah, definitely it brought so it for her. And so, and the news guy was like speechless. Like they took the camera off of her real quick and put it on him, and like his jaw was dropped <laughs> on air. Well, remember, we live in a world where the courts have ruled that parts of the Civil Rights Act of 1965 are no longer valid. So, okay, to understand the slope of aggregate demand, you have to figure out how a change in the price level affects consumption, investment, and net exports. If you think of that sounded like a lot of words, but if you think about it, think for a second, it should make sense. Higher price, we no consume. Higher price, no consume. Maybe save equal investment. Right? Higher price, me no buy domestic. Maybe me buy hey, hey, foreign. English. Foreign. <laughs> Not I'm just using it. She's saving time. I was so confused there. Oh, I was missing a bunch of words. Oh, well, maybe get a notebook out. Oh. Oh, I a Gavin, did you just throw shade? Because that's a really skinny tree to be thrown shade. <laughs> All my notes right here. Hey. That's hey. That right there is an unopened umbrella attempting to throw shade. I'm not going to take your stuff. Hey, just for the thing of notes, are we going over the supply curve too? Or are you oh, yes, we will go over the supply curve too. I'm getting a phone call from Virginia. I'm getting a phone call from Virginia. But we have a lot more to invest in, oh, in demand curve. Okay. Yeah, so. We look at the wealth effect. And remember, what's the difference between wealth and being rich? Assets and gold. Yes. How did you get them to take you off the call? Good. All right. So we assume that the price level has risen. The dollars that you have in your hand will buy you fewer goods and services. So even if you want the same quantity of goods and services, the dollars in your hand will not get you that same quantity of goods and services because the price level has risen. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Everybody's with me? Yes. All right. I hope the people who are gone today actually watch this lecture. You should maybe, in the group text, tell them to do so. Do you have a group text? Yeah, you're not telling them. Okay. Oh. So I your real wealth, sorry. your real purchasing power is low because of the raise in the price level, because of the increase in the price level. You feel then poorer. If you budget $100 a week for groceries, and you go to the grocery store, and there's less stuff in your cart when you check out, but you still got to hand over a Benjamin, you feel poorer. Correct? If you have to fill up your car every week because you drive that much, but now it costs you 20% more, you feel poorer. I would be $65 for my <laughs> every week. <laughs> so as a result, as a result, consumption falls. Duh. So that is the wealth effect. We're talking about all of the reasons why the AD curve slows.
slopes downward. I'm giving you the reasons why aggregate demand slopes downward. Reason one was the wealth effect. When your dollars buy less, you feel poorer. <laughs> it's almost like on April 12th, Andrews, on to the pattern. <laughs> wow, Andrew, it takes you long enough. <laughs> when she starts to list stuff. The next reason would be the interest rate effect, discussing the relationship between price level and investment. Suppose the price level rises. Buying your goods and services takes more money. To get that more money, you sell some of the investment assets you have been holding. You sell your bonds. You sell your antiques. You sell the extra car that you used to drive in the 4th of July parade. You sell... That was pretty specific. Yeah, Did you sell a car that you used to drop in the... No. T. Hope sold his street rod to buy my engagement ring. That's a nice guy. Just don't get married. Oh. Then you can spend your cards. Yeah, Alright. So you sell your assets. The selling of those assets, because when you buy a bond, that's a, you've given a loan, basically, right? So you're taking that loan money back, that drives interest rates up. When interest rates go up, it is now more expensive to borrow. Borrowing is investments. So as price level goes up, investment goes down. Yes, there is an inverse relationship price level and investment, and an inverse relationship between price level and consumption, the wealth effect, the interest rate effect. NX, and the reason we had to do the last chapter, the exchange rate effect. What was the last one? Okay, interest rates. The exchange rate effect, the relationship between price level and exchange or net exports exchange. Okay, price level rises. All of this would go the other direction if I were saying price level falls. So, when the price level rises, our interest rates rise for all of the things that we just discussed. Okay. Foreign investors now want to buy more bonds from the U.S. because they are paying more out because investment rates have risen. Yay! Interest rates have risen. Not investment rates. Yeah, interest, thank you. Thank you, yes. Interest rates have risen. Okay. So, now there's a higher demand for our dollars in foreign markets. They want our money. So our exchange rate, does our exchange rate appreciate or depreciate? It appreciates. The dollar is desired. What does that do to the cost of U.S. goods that are exported? makes them more expensive to foreign nations. And so what happens to the number of those exports? They're going to decrease. Foreigners aren't going to buy the more expensive U.S. goods. What does that do to the cost of foreign goods coming to the U.S.? It makes them relatively less expensive and thus increases the quantity. American goods are more expensive, foreign goods are less expensive. You have fewer dollars in your fist, what are you going to buy? You buying a GE or a Samsung television? 
I'm buying a GE or a Sony. So, we're going to go buy appliances. We'll buy an LG or a Whirlpool. Y'all know the difference between those two now. I don't know. LG is German. LG is German, guys. I need that. Oh, no, wait. LG is North Korea or South Korea. I, I fixed myself. It's so North Korean. LG is North Korean. I fixed it. You can buy it. All right. So net exports fall as price levels rise. This one also works in inverse. Price levels fall, net exports rise. rise. With me so far? So when price level fall, or when price level rises, all three of those things would fall? And thus, when price level rises, those. GDP falls. Yeah. So, to put it all together, Rise. No, investment fall. Investment. Because interest rates have risen. risen. Yeah. Alright. So the increase in the price level reduces the quantity of goods and services demanded because of the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the Yes. So this is saying in the short run, price level rises and then all the time. It's all short yes. run. Yeah. Yes. But then, is it in the long run? It all kind of evens out. Price level rises means there's inflation, right? Yes. Which you said is a good thing. A it necessary is. thing within a measured quantity. Yeah. You want some inflation. Inflation is all these things say, basically are saying price level rises, not just In the short run. But in the long run, raising price levels will end up being good. According to the classical theory, yes. Yeah. Try not to iron out all of the wrinkles in your brains over this chapter. It, it'll get, it'll make more sense the more of it we cover. There will be a point where we add on to it. Oh, yes. We're summarizing aggregate demand. I'm about to go do short run aggregate system. So can we connect the, this graph to like the price level money supply graph too? Um, <clears throat> there are instances in which you would graph the two side by side and make connections betwixt them, yes. So like in a short answer worth like 20 points. Level rise in like in a short answer worth 20 some points. It'd be like price level rise yeah. is Gonna have You'll do it on two graphs. You can't you can't take graphs with different scales and lay them on each other, but you can do it side by side and carry numbers over. Oh, so it'll be like they increase the money supply line? Yeah, yeah. Same. All right. So what they've shown you here with these colors, the red arrow, the decrease in consumption gets you there, then the decrease in investment gets you there, then the decrease in net exports gets you there. And they're just showing you that it's a cumulative impact of the decrease in consumption, investment, and net exports together that causes the decrease in GDP as a result of an increase in price level. Are you with me? If you had to write out a why does aggregate demand decrease, you could say as a result of an increase in price level. Consumption decreases, interest rate increases, resulting in a decrease in investment. Exchange rate. Right. You could say wealth effect, interest rate effect, exchange rate effect, explain all three of those. It would be a lot of points. There's at least two points, two points, two points, one point for putting it all together into GDP and one point for graphing it. So it's an eight point question right there. Get ready. If I feel like throwing you a bone, easy short answer question. Because this is easy compared to what's coming in the next 50 slides. Okay. Now, why might this curve shift? Because so far, all we've talked about is moving along the curve. 
we've changed GEP. <coughs> right? Before we would have said we changed quantity demanded. Right? Now we're changing GDP. Okay? So we've shifted GDP. Now, why might the curve itself shift? Why would we have a repositioning of the entire aggregate demand curve? Before we've talked about what kinds of things shifting demand in the micro sense. Consumer, consumer, consumer. consumer what? Tastes and preferences. Taste consumer and income. The number of buyers. Number of consumers in the market. Okay. So what? What if people die in that big shifts? Well, yeah, I mean, the zombie apocalypse is going to throw this graph a little out of whack. <laughs> so, like, a, a recession. Oh, a recession. Would that make the number of buyers go down? Yes. Um, get ready for a whole huge list of aggregate demand determinants. Boom. Okay. There's seven on the next slide. And it only covers C and I. Oh. Wait. All right. Need to memorize this. Yep. Any event that changes consumption, investment, government spending, or net exports, except for a change in the price level. So anything that's not a change in the price level will shift the curve. Oh. Because that's just the same as micro, right? Any change in price just moved you along the curve. A change in price could never shift that. So, strong correlation between these so far. Just the explanations are different. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Agnes, we're rich! Agnes, that was your first problem, was marrying a woman named Agnes. Wow. Don't judge. Agnes and I love each other. Actually, that just made me think of Despicable Me. Oh, my heart. Davis. Marries a woman named Agnes. Davis retracts his hand. All right, I like that. Self-serving student. Boom. You ready for this? No. Oh, bah, bah. Stop it. Stop it right now. All right. Possible causes of changes in consumption. And there's a million of them. These are examples. No. Million. Let's write them all. OK. So a change in consumption will shift the curve. Why might we see a change in consumption? Why a stock market boom or a stock market crash? crash. Remember I talked to you about when I worked at Ameritrade and the tech bubble was bursting and the stock market was down hundreds and hundreds of points every day? Don't get concerned when the stock market moves 100 points now because 100 points relative to its total value is very little. Think about percentage changes. The stock market is down 5 to 10% in a day. That is bad. If it's fluctuating a percent, man. Okay. Whoops. For some reason, society decides that it is deeply interested in saving rather than consuming. Why might that be? All kinds of options. All kinds of options. Tax hikes, or as we've just gotten, tax cuts. Theoretically, based upon the tax cut that Congress put in place that we're all enjoying right now, we should be seeing a pretty big increase in consumption. change in my paycheck over the past three months compared to the last three months of 2017 less than $20 a month so not 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 increasing a lot of rebuy consumption 
on the basis of that tax code. So what's $15 a pound? That's one pound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on the list. A so month. Uh -huh. The problem is interest rates have also gone up. So guess where my tax savings are going? To the interest rate. <laughs> to pay off the more expensive debt that Eric had. Yeah. No revise. <laughs> no me. Why, well, thank you for that extra money slides across table. <laughs> Changes in investment. Firms will buy new computers, equipment, factories. Some of this can happen because of a change in technology. Technology changes and the firms kind of have to. Now, let me give you a piece of information. What has, other than the fact that Scott Pruden's kind of become a rather infamous individual, what has he been doing at the EPA pretty recently? He's been rolling back a bunch of regulations. Let me give you a clue what those regulations were doing. They were forcing manufacturers to invest money in new technology. Now, because those regulations have gone away, those manufacturers can keep doing things the way they had been doing them. Because businesses lobby against government regulation because it makes them spend money. They don't want to spend the money. The auto manufacturers don't want to produce more fuel efficient cars. It's more expensive for them to do so. But we know in this standpoint, that those regulations can stimulate spending and thus stimulate the economy. And we also know a planet to live on that sustains life is nice. But on the other hand, government regulations do stifle business and cause them to spend money that they don't want to spend. Here, producer, you suggested social costs. Have you we talked about that last semester, the social costs? Yeah. Producers don't take social costs into account at all. That is the role of government to force but if the producers to do so. Consumers are willing to pay more for that hybrid or whatever the case is. Wouldn't they actually spend money on that? So you're saying that consumers should willingly choose to pay more because of their concern over social costs? Yeah, so if they have this concern in the first place, mm -hmm. that's going to create a higher demand. Mm -hmm. They're going to produce more. So you have your own way of that technology. Uh, agreed, agreed. Um, except we understand quite a bit about human behavior, don't we? Yeah, it's not consistent. Exactly. And if I'm already struggling to buy what I buy to live, what what percentage of the global population has the discretionary income to make those socially conscious kinds of so either we force the cost on the consumers who may not be able to afford it, or the producers. And ultimately, the consumers will bear the cost, yeah. because the producers are always going to pass it on to them. Um, it's just whether or not and that on the, the government has the will to make those decisions. Now, how much they pass on depends on the elasticity, right? Uh, yes. How much they pass on will depend upon elasticity. So for different markets, it varies. Yep. And it varies size. globally. Tremendously globally. Yeah. This is why rolling back global climate change is so difficult. Changes in well, it, it revealed. So it actually is exciting stuff, Jared, because this should be very relevatory to you about how the world works. I mean, the questions Jared was asking are, are very real world questions for you. Now, many of you are going to be voting, if not in May, in November. How many of you will be of age to vote in November? Oh, yeah. So you need to be an informed voter. But can you make your voting decision based just on stance on social issues? Can you make your voting decision based just on stance on economic issues? It has to be everything. But to be a truly informed voter, I think you have to understand some of the motivations, right? Okay. Uh, not consumer. Overall, expectations, 
regarding, hey, things are really looking up, or, oh my gosh, it's all doom and gloom, and we're all going to, you know, it's going to be the Mayan end of the world in 2012, and so why should I invest or save money or going to die? All of those kinds of things matter. Oh my gosh, um, the Earth is warming too much, and the Atlantic current is just going to stop, and so all of the icebergs will melt, and we're all going to flood and die, and so what's the point anyway? So people stop saving, which slows investment, yada, yada, yada. Are you with me? Yeah. Changes in interest rates or monetary policy dramatically affect investment. We covered that pretty extensively several chapters ago. And offering things like investment tax credits and other tax incentives. Um, the city of Papillion is getting ready uh, to declare a section of downtown um, blighted property. Um, what that does is it allows them to offer a financing mechanism to developers called tax increment financing, or what's often called TIF. So what that means is if, if a property is already developed and it needs to be redeveloped, that means that there's infrastructure there, that means there's zoning kind of stuff going on, there's plotting kind of stuff going on, and it's old, and generally it's messed up. It needs to be fixed. And so that makes it more expensive to redevelop existing property than it does to go out to what we call naked land or bare land and develop it. Because all you gotta do is dig a trench and put in your water and your gas and your sewer, and you're good. If you're redeveloping, you've gotta locate the gas, the sewer, the electric. You've gotta fix what's antiquated about it. Maybe install new, you might have to clean up some waste. Right? So there might be some diesel spills or some lead contamination, who knows what's there, right? You've got to deal with everything that's already there. And because it's existing property, the properties around it are already developed, and you've got to mitigate the impact on them. So it's way more expensive. So what TIF financing does is it says, okay, so for the length of the period of this financing, let's say 10 years, we're going to value the property where it's valued right now. For the next 10 years, that's the value that you're going to pay property taxes on. Okay? So the, the city, the county, the state get no more money out of that land than they've been getting for the next 10 years. In the meantime, the investor fixes up the property, redevelops it. Right. At the end of that 10 years, the property value is reassessed, and it goes from here to here, we hope. right? And now, all of a sudden, the school district, the city, the state, the county get that increased amount of tax revenue. So in exchange for having deferred the differential for 10 years, they get way higher. Because the chances are that if the property went undeveloped, its property value would actually have done what? Decreased. Right. So can you sell that property before the 10 years is up and still sell it for that market value that's depreciated? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, Without, and you don't have to recapture that no. money. You can just keep, so you didn't pay the extra taxes. It's lower for those 10 years. You sell it, you don't have to pay taxes. No, you there's no retro. If they develop it sooner than the 10 years, so they just pop it that extra, like, what they could be paying on the so they, their, their hope is to redevelop it and be making the money on it.